for the young lady to ask the first question and then we'll come on back. Okay. This was to the gentleman who said he had voted for uh, Donald. And uh, you did not explain your reasons why. Would you care to do that? Yeah. Lisa is going to hold the mic and walk around to whoever needs it. So what I'm saying, now, we have dysfunctional schools. That's why I listed Jackson, August Martin. We've been voting Democrat for the past 50 years, right? My voting machines don't work on election day. You think that could happen in, in, Little, in, uh, in Little Neck or Douglas to the Bayside? No. That's because we've been doing the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Yeah. I just had a moment of clarity as I, as I was uh, filling out that sheet. And I said, you know, uh, let, me, let me make a protest at this point. And so I voted for Trump. Thank you. Okay, so have to, uh, can you guys raise your hands? So just uh, pass the Ellis, then the gentleman behind him, then the gentleman in the hat, and then the gentleman in the gray, gentleman in the brown, lady in the red. Now remember that order. You guys remember that order? Pass the Alex, then the two rows back, then two rows back, then coming over here, the gentleman in the gray, the gentleman in the brown. Raise your hand, man. Okay. You have your hands up? We got more time. We just everybody. Now please, no soliloquies, no five minutes. I'm gonna cut you off. I'm telling everybody up front, ask a question. If you want to make a statement, say a statement, you're gonna make a statement. Because we don't have all day. Alright, is everybody good with that? Yes. Thank you. Brian Ellis Gibbs, pastor of Queens Baptist Church in Queens Village. Um, the Electoral College, can someone comment about the Electoral College? And there is this movement to change how the vote is done, as well as can you talk about the importance of 2017 election here in the city? I'm the junior one here, so I'll go first. But the Electoral College, uh, well, number one, I don't think they're going to change it because it's worked for you in the past. You can't complain when it doesn't work for you if it worked for you in the past. You just kind of, those, are, those are the rules. You know the rules going in. And uh, the purpose of the Electoral College, remember, is to, it's, it's about state rights. Uh, the, little, the, the states with smaller populations, which far outnumber the big states like New York, Florida, Ohio, California, and Texas, don't want to be railroaded. They want to have a say. So the Electoral College is a way of making sure that the states each state has equal power, just as similar to the function of Senate. That's why no matter how big you are or how small you are, you only get two senators. That's the way of evening the playing field. Uh, now, again, and us blacks, not only are we only 13% of the population, we're actually mostly populated in those big states, right? We're kind of concentrated, so we're at a double disadvantage as far as that goes. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, the point is, the system isn't going to save us. We're going to have to save ourselves. So don't, 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 even if they change electoral college, our work still is going to be our work. With your permission, I'll chime in on this one. The uh, 2017 and 2018 are going to be critical, critical years. Uh, re, you're going to have a census come up, and then you're going to have redistricting uh, on, on, the, on the map, on the electoral map. And that map is how the Republicans have been able to gerrymander and stay in power. And the, the elections, uh, in the, the, the smaller local elections are going to be so critical because those are the people who will do the map that will either guarantee Republican victories forever or guarantee that there will be a fairer playing field. Now, the Electoral College, of course, was created by Madison, James Madison, uh, and it is a device. Madison didn't trust the people. Madison was one of those people who felt that if you have direct elections, the people uh, would take over. And Madison, of course, who represented the rich class of his day, uh, was ensuring that the Electoral College would be there to save at, to serve rather as a as a wall to make sure that 
You don't, you don't elect a popularist of one type or another, somebody who can really express the needs of the, of the country, where they have another shot at making sure that you don't win. Now let me just uh, sum up also, the electoral college change is not gonna happen while we have a president and a Congress and a Senate that's Republican. So let's forget about that and move on. Uh, just, you know, we'll, again, you know, if you wanna break down the election, uh, you know, the president-elect Trump won with lower numbers than Romney lost with and McCain lost with. The numbers to win the election are there, we just didn't turn out because of a myriad of reasons. Uh, so as I said earlier, you can go from the Haitians being pissed off in Florida, they didn't come out, to, to Hispanics not going for uh, Hillary overwhelmingly. I mean, there's a lot of breakdowns on different pockets of the country why people didn't turn out for Hillary. A lot of 40 years of, of Clintonism, I think people were burnt out. The Democratic Party refused to re recognize it and realize it and accept it. We were too New York centered, you know, and the media in New York was too biased towards Hillary. The rest of the country was resentful of that. Um, so there are a myriad of reasons why, it, but the numbers to elect a Democrat that people want to believe in, or even a, 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 another candidate that people believe in, the, major, the numbers are there. It's just that we did not turn out because people were upset for a variety of reasons and didn't have the numbers. Next let, question. Let, 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 me, let me respond to that. I want to approach it from just a, a little different angle uh, than that. The only reason we are having discussion about the Electoral College now is because our candidate lost. Let's be honest with ourselves. If Hillary had a one, we didn't, you, you didn't hear any, the last time we heard conversation about the Electoral College is when the hanging chat uh, incident with, with, with Bush, right? Bush Gore, right? Now watch this. We didn't bring up the Electoral College when Obama won the first time. We didn't bring up the Electoral College when Obama won the second term. We're talking about the Electoral College now. I think it's deeper than that, okay? The truth of the matter is, people have their opinions, and once they are on their opinion, you can't change them. All the polls told us early on that Trump would beat Hillary. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. All of the polls told us early on that Bernie Sanders would trounce Hillary Clinton, right? But we were so attached to Hillary like a Siamese twin that we disregarded some of the facts that were being put right before us. So now, I don't think the conversation should be the Electoral College. I think we need to go back and reassess the fact that millions and millions of our young, upwardly mobile people, educated young blacks, just could not get with Hillary and she lost. I don't think we need to be focused on the Electoral College and changing that. I think we need to be trying to find somebody, if, it's like if we ever get another change, because with, with regards to the lines and the drawing, they're going to work even harder to draw new lines that gives them the upper hand. And listen, it is the lot that we have to bear right now. Next question. My name is Bishop Aiken out of Springfield Church of the Lord's Gospel. And I also was a Trump supporter. And I said this a year ago, he's going to win. And my reason was, is because the Bible says that we perish because of a lack of knowledge. And I don't blame the college for doing it, and Madison for being his, in his position. I blame the politicians that we see. And I'll explain that. It's because we don't have enough knowledge to make an educated decision. And we know that the, the, the politicians are in the right place. But now you come and have a, how dare you come and have a town meeting 
when you don't have answers. Now you come to the field, Negro, to see what we want. The truth of the matter is, and I said this to Charles Brown, we're very good friends. The question comes up, why don't someone put together a program that would educate us on the politics of voting? And then we could do this a little better. Because now it agitates you that are in the seat and privy to the information. We don't have it. We don't have it. We don't have it. So I'm asking the question, is there a possibility of for the next election that there is some type of program that may be, you know, initiative out of Springfield or this area that would educate us to sit down at the table with you? Because I believe it was Reverend Green that you said you went into a meeting with Al Sharpton that didn't include us. The 1% or the 5% is making decisions for the other 95. And then when the legislation comes down, we have to agree with it. You want us to, Charles Brown was good at it. You want us to stand in front of the bulldozer after you signed the petition. <laughs> you knew three months ago it's matriculating down, but now when it get here, you want to have a meeting and inform us. Why can't we have a, a program put together that would help us make better decisions on this election? Okay, I'm gonna be quick. I want to I want to respectfully disagree with you on several points. Respectfully, uh, from one clergy to another, I don't think that the problem is a lack of education. I think we have a lot of educated people who understand the voting system, the voting process here in the United States, uh, in New York State, and in New York City. I don't think. And again, it's just my opinion. Okay, my considered opinion. I, that could be one of the, the problems, okay? But understand one thing. Understand that it goes back to what I sort of alluded to earlier, is that the people who we elect and the people who lead us. Now, I was in the meeting with Sharpton and other religious leaders but I, I didn't say I was supporting her then, okay? Because I've always been a Obama supporter because it was a black thing for me, even though some of my religious beliefs and biblical beliefs are in conflict with some of his policies. But I'm not a one issue uh, supporter, okay? I think the, the bigger problem lies with black people not learning how to identify as a group because we vote a lot. But half the people that vote don't really understand what they vote for. And I think that's, what, if it's gonna be some education, we need to educate people on what we're voting on, okay? And when we talk about politics, all politics are really local. And somebody, I don't know if when you ask about the election, the 2017 election, if you were talking about, uh, were you talking about what's going to take place in the city? Well, I'm going to let Senator talk first because you don't really want to hear what I got to say about that. 2017, 2018, because my issue is, I think that we have the same thing we've done with Hillary Clinton, we've done with Bill de Blasio. And, and, and we, have, we have sort of given uh, Bill de Blasio political immunity in the black community and we act like he's uh, the savior who's come with the cavalry to save us when nothing is further from the truth. For three years, three to four years, we've been, we've been uh, at odds with this administration. And those of you who follow the news, follow the impact in the news, know that we have been going toe to toe with this mayor on MWB, his MWBE policies, which are disastrous. 1% was given to black and brown contractors. And the truth of the matter is, and I'm not, you know, I'm going to be one-sided because the truth of the matter is, de Blasio has not done right by black people in this town. And Andrew Cuomo has not done right by, uh, uh, people, black people in this state. Now, I tell people all the time when I'm when I'm when I'm dialoguing on social media, when I'm interacting with my friends, when I'm giving speeches, I tell people all the time as a preacher, you know, some some uh, senator, you know, they tried to give me this the, the attachment, governor's pastor. 
That ain't true. I'm not his pastor. He's not a member of Mount Nebo. Okay. Uh, I have worked with him uh, and uh, with moving the needle forward with MWBE in the state, but his record is poor as well. When we deal, and this is the difference between a Johnny Green and an Al Sharpton, and a Johnny Green and a Jesse Jackson. If you're going to deal with these politicians, don't get so close where you can't use your slapping hand. <laughs> and so some of us, and, and, and I, I, you know, I hate to be stereotypical, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about the elected officials. Now I got to talk about black preachers. Some of us, some of us can be bought so cheap. Cheap. They don't even have to give us money. All they have to do is show up at our churches and have a photo op and say collard greens and neck bones. And we're ready to jump off the roof. Okay? Bill de Blasio has been going around talking about, you know, uh, the success of stop and frisk. Guess what? O Commissioner O'Neill just came out last week and said that the city, the NYPD, is still using the tactic of stop and frisk. It's very much alive. But we've been sold on the idea that there's no more stop and frisk, that Bill de Blasio ended it. I've been fighting with this where he talks about his affordable housing plan. Guess what? Affordable for who? All right. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So, you know, the, the men, the, you know, me and the sense that we tight, but we sure disagree on this de Blasio thing. All right. But we, we fight in private. We don't wear our differences in public. But anyway, de Blasio and Cuomo both. 20, 2017 de Blasio. 2018 Cuomo. Listen, if they think that we're going to allow them to give all this money away, to other communities, just two, three weeks ago, they gave away a $300 million development project in the South Bronx that they could have given to a minority developer, and they did. They gave it to a majority developer from Rhode Island. <laughs> let the, let the, I'm, I'm going at this. <laughs> I was trying to say that I hopefully differ with my, my esteemed uh, pastor on several issues, but I think that there's a, another issue that I want to take on. I want to remind us that, that Malcolm X taught us that if you fail a study, you're going to love your friends and you're going to hate your enemies. I'm sorry, that you're going to love your enemies and you're going to hate your friends. Just sitting next to him and throwing me. I think that a vote for Trump is a fundamental misunderstanding of who Trump is and what he represents. I think that is such an amazing misunderstanding of a man who started out being sued by the Civil Rights Administration because he wouldn't rent to black people. That he, him and his father, who was allegedly arrested at a Klan rally, it's a misunderstanding of a person whose history, he's, you see, sometimes you got to believe what people tell you. If folks say that they're going to do something bad to you, don't believe that, oh, he's just talking. There's some folk in Germany, if they were around, they would tell you, y'all should read what they say and believe what they're gonna do. I'm not bringing it home to those who didn't get me. Hitler and Mein Kampf told you, this is what I'm going to do to you. And he's exactly what he did, only worse. Trump is such a danger to the American people as a whole and to black people in particular. If you want to protest, now I'm not against a protest vote because, you know, I'm, my first choice was not Hillary, as one or two of you may know. Um, you had some fine candidates to do. You could have gone with Jill Stein. You could have gone with Johnson. Those are protests. But when you are voting for the person who says 
that he got a noose for you, then you get you voting for the noose. Well, this is almost the same, but I'm gonna be respectful. I see the other hands up. I'm gonna try to keep to the same order. Um, so the gentleman, I want to see if you remember that gen order. gentleman in the hat, the gentleman in the gray, uh, gentleman in the glasses. Then, yeah. huh? the, the lady in the red after the gentleman with glasses, and then uh, we're gonna have. Well, we didn't, we didn't do anything in this corner, and they got mad. But I didn't see them. My, my back was to them. So you guys pick one of one of either Rivers or, or Mrs. And then the lady in the green, and then the lady with the scarf. All right. Now you ain't getting the question. Come on, brother. Hi, my name is T.L. Cross. I'm a musician and a producer and stuff, and I'm really, really into uh, the community. I'm doing a documentary on the, uh, the, the history of black queens, starting from the 1600s, okay? And so I, I am here because I, I am very concerned about what is going on. I definitely, uh, I respect everybody who spoke up here, and I, I learned a lot today, you know, I learned a lot. Um, I also heard uh, what you said, Brother Brian, you know, when you talked about we have to do for ourselves. There's a lot of things that we have to do for ourselves, and I agree with that. I think that uh, uh, one is a comment, then there's a question. I feel like Hillary Clinton's disparities when it comes to the black community is very well documented. You know, we talked about Super Predator, we talked about these various different things. One of the things that's not documented as well is some of the black people, and some of the black leadership in Vermont that felt that they were invisible to Bernie Sanders in Vermont when they were trying to get his attention on black issues in Vermont, okay? Don't so, tell that, don't tell that in this room. <laughs> now, and, and, then, and then to further go into the whole Trump thing, what I will say first of all is I, I feel like sometimes the presidential election is too much of a popularity contest, right? I don't like everything about anybody, period, all right? I don't agree with, Everything anyone says that I've ever met, if we, if I ever met somebody that agree with everything they said, they would be me. We'd be the same person, all right? So the reality of it is, there's a popularity contest. Uh, uh, President Obama, he was actually uh, stumping for Hillary Clinton. There's a lot of people who love President Obama. Therefore, they voted Hillary Clinton because President Obama stood next to her. But the reality of it is, whether it's protest votes, whether it's votes that has to do with your conscience, what I would say is yes, the magnet schools are now here. One school turned into four schools. You know, here in Southeast Queens and in Masspeth and in these other places, okay, in Masspeth <laughs> and these other places, uh, uh, they, they got better uh, things for their schooling. But I just want to say this. The fact that they're, that they're doing this to our schools, brother, don't have nothing to do with vote Democrat, Republican. It's black. It's a black thing. Okay, because the reality of it is we can vote Republican. If you can't say that you voted for Donald Trump because Donald Trump would actually help rectify that, if you can't say that you voted for Donald Trump, I'm sorry, let me say 60 seconds. If you can't say that you voted for Donald Trump because you feel as though in your heart of hearts that he loves your brothers and sisters, or if he doesn't love them, he will do right by your brothers and sisters, then I feel like you've wasted your vote. That, that wasn't the question, that was a comment, so we're going to move on to the brother in the gray. Because we ain't getting into no back and forth on what individuals did on their vote. That's their individual right as an American. All right? We in agreement with that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joe Gonzalez, and I live in Bedford Stuyvesant, section of Brooklyn. And the reason I came out here is because I heard they were having this meeting here, and I want you to share with you that we in Bed-Stuy, the last two days, are also having these meetings, and these very spirited discussions. And uh, we'll have them in the next few days. Um, and I'm painfully disappointed. I traveled all the way out here only to be told we don't have all day. I think when things concern us, we should have all day, and all night, and all the next day, um, Brother Tomry. But I'll give you a pass. The theater has a play tonight, brother, so they got to make their money too. Oh, okay, but we should be we should have more than just a few moments. Um, I, I think that if uh, just a few things, real quick. 
Uh, while we're looking at and uh, holding our elected officials responsible, we should also be holding the pastors of these churches responsible and not forget that well-known pastors in this community and across the city supported Republican Pataki, Republican Giuliani, Republican Bloomberg, as long as charter school money and other little goodies were coming. So it shouldn't only be politicians, but these pastors. We have to hold them responsible for their failures, okay? I'm pained that the first black president, we voted for him, myself included, in 2008, only because he was black. We didn't know him, he didn't have any black agenda. Eight years later, we know who he worked for for eight years. And it hurts me, having been thrown out of meetings at the National Action Network and all across this city, okay, that black leaders, as Reverend Green correctly appointed, failed to hold Obama responsible for not discussing racism. So my own daughter said to me this morning that she found it repulsive that Barack Obama would meet with Donald Trump and lecture Trump on racism when Obama himself ignored racism for eight years. Okay? We know who benefited over the past eight years. But I wanted to, before I take my seat, ladies and gentlemen, make a suggestion to you because we're having these conversations in Bed Stuy. And because we have next year's mayor, controller, public advocate, district attorney, borough president, and 51 city council members all up for election, and they divide an $84 billion budget, that what we're doing in Bed Stuy is we're drafting a written document which we only recently found out certain other constituencies actually presented to Hillary. Literally a written document, a written list of demands. What we're doing in Bed Stuy, and I suggest you out here do the same, prepare a written document and a written questionnaire asking all of these people who will be in your face very soon, who have already making deals with your pastors. Right. Can I get in the church, Pastor? Can I have 10 minutes, Pastor? Right. Okay. A written document asking the very tough questions about MBE and other subjects. A written document. We're doing that in bed style, which is where I live at. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Okay. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I have friends out here. My daughter lives near here. But that written document demand that these candidates for office, present company included, as well as all these others coming at us, answer just like everywhere you go, you have to fill out an application from a driver's license to a job interview for an apartment. You have to fill out something. There's some paper trail where they ask you questions. Let's start hitting our electeds with a questionnaire. Okay, and then post that questionnaire online. That's what we're doing in bedside, and I thank all of you, and you have a blessed day. Can I, can I say something else? Two, two, two things. You should, number one, you should have known better than going to the House of Justice to say something negative about Barack Obama. That's number one. That just wasn't going to happen. Number two, you named all those elected officials. I want you to go back to Brooklyn and ask all those elected officials, and you can ask every black city council member on the council now, what did they say to Bill de Blasio when he awarded that $300 million contract to that majority company in, 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 in Rhode Island? Now, you're right about what you said about the preachers. Now, we can take the hit. Those of us who are truly out here on the front line, we can take the hit. We can take the honest discussion about where the preachers are. I tell people all the time, and this is one of the reasons why I'm reluctant about taking state money and, and city money, government money, to run programs through the church because that's how they keep these preachers quiet. But if you make it, I tell people all the time, the reason I'm able to speak loud and clear without fear is because they can't take a program away from me. I'm, I'm totally taken care of by the congregation I serve and I feel it incumbent upon me to fight for those very poor people who allow me to have the kind of lifestyle that I have. Plus, I own my own business, okay? So I'm not looking for, for money to come in from the state, et cetera. So I think you're right, and then I want to give credit to where credit is due. My friend, my senator, and I call him my senator, I'm not even in his district, Senator James Sanders, is one of the only elected officials 
and I'm sorry for those of you who elected officials here, not at all, but he's one of the only ones that's been vocal and speaking out on this issue of MWBE. It's a shame that we have a black speaker of the assembly, Carl Hasty, and he says nothing about Andrew Cuomo awarding LaGuardia Airport to Skanska, LaGuardia Gateway Park, a four and a half billion dollar project, and there are no minority, there's no minority participation at the prime level. Something is wrong with that. You gave away Hudson Yards. No black participation at the prime level. Something is wrong with that. Let me say minority participation. Now you have Penn Farley. No black or minority. And nobody's raising hell but one or two of us. So if you want to listen, we talk about these candidates who go around and talk about income inequality. Listen, I don't care about $15 an hour. If you make $15 an hour in New York City, you can't do anything with that. Talk to me about the real money. Um, yes, yeah, so we can roll back to the issues. Um, right now it's supposed to be Mike next, but uh, I'm gonna take the privilege of the floor. I see the first young man that rails his hand, so come on down and ask your question. You're young enough to get down here. Come on down. Yeah. Oh, sweet. That's all right. All right. Don't take a job yet. <laughs> um, well, uh, first of all, thank you for letting me ask this question. But first of all, just I'm amazed to see everybody here and all their, your faces. And um, I think the most important thing is, obviously, a lot of us are upset about Donald Trump. And uh, I think what we need to do is just keep up the momentum. Like, I mean, I would love it to be like a Sunday service every week. Every face that's here <laughs> would be able to get together and mobilize because I feel like uh, politics goes like in waves. So it's like, oh, we're really, really angry. We're really, uh, let's go. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was just curious to know if there was any plans uh, for us just to get together. I mean, outside of a church, outside any any place where we can get together and just talk, so we can keep up the momentum. Because three hours, four hours um, on a Saturday is just not enough. So I was just wondering if there was any plans for that. And I love you guys and thank you for your time. Um, just to answer that, the, the Senator Sanders, myself, and um, Assemblyman elect Pinnell have pledged to work together on continuing a series of these meetings. The next one will be on November 20th. Uh, location to be determined. We haven't locked it down yet. Uh, we are going to be working together, Senator Sanders. And I spoke after the election about the need to work even in more sync together. We've been working together quietly well over the last two years since I got into the state senate with him. And I can tell you that, and that's why I did not endorse his opponent. I stayed out of the race because we do have a good working embryonic relationship. And what has happened uh, over the last four or five days is that I know he's gotten his phone blown up by people. I'm getting. <laughs> I had to turn back on Messenger because I got like 30 messages on Messenger because normally on Messenger I get these people from South Africa and Italy and Russia called yeah, 